I'm going to talk about intercorporeal collaboration in, in late stage uh, dementia. Uh, and I'll start by sort of giving a context to the research um, we have we are engaged in. Uh, since quite a few years back, we have a research program called Living with Dementia. And, and we now sort of uh, coming close to the end of that program. And in that research program, we are uh, about 10 persons, uh, researchers uh, collaborating uh, around dementia. We have three sub programs. The first is about collaboration uh, with very much with a focus on collaboration involving people with late stage um, dementia a second program around dementia and learning, uh, in particular, learning how to use iPads and other communicative um, communication devices. And the third area is um, multilingual aspects of um, dementia and interaction and communication. So, so I'm gonna talk about the research, part of the research we be doing around collaboration and late stage dementia. I've been working quite closely for several years with two colleagues, uh, Anna Ekström, uh, with a background in cognitive science and, and uh, uh, conversational uh, analysis, and Ali Reza Mailesi with a background in linguistics and, and also conversational uh, conversation analysis. So I'm, I'm going to quite often when I'm when I'm, I'm making this presentation, I'm going to use the pronoun we and that refers to to the to the three of us, uh, because we published jointly about our uh, research. Our sort of um, entrance or approach to study uh, collaboration with people living with late stage dementia is we want to <clears throat> enhance our knowledge about um, how people uh, with late stage dementia can engage with other persons and participate in activities. If you have a look at the literature and, and research literature around late stage dementia, you'll find that there's astonishingly little research about people living with late stage dementia. And if you look further into the clinical literature, you will find that, that in general, uh, that there's a, a, a general idea that people with living with, with dementia in a late stage basically lost most of their abilities. So they're, sort of the implication is there's not much to look at, but there are actually, uh, we found, and, and it's quite interesting. So it's a research area that's been quite under-researched for, for uh, uh, a long time. As a start, I wanted to say something about what late stage dementia is or how it's defined. As we all know, Dementia is a progressive uh, disorder. It goes from early stages to mid stage, stage and then to late stage. Um, and in late stage dementia, most bodily systems are quite affected. The motor system, perceptual system, cognitive system, emotional systems, and, and of course, linguistic systems are quite affected. Uh, and as a result, people living with late stage dementia have, have very, uh, have few expressive resources in, in terms of, of using either body, the body or, or uh, uh, language and so on and so forth. Um, there's no um, standard definition of what late stage dementia is. But we've been using a kind of holistic functional definition, meaning that with late stage dementia, we mean people who are basically not able to care for themselves at all. They generally have difficulties getting up from a chair, from bed, 
moving around on their own. Most of the people we have studied can't talk at all, or they might use uh, um, short phrases or something, uh, but, but are very limited in, in expressive terms. There are some clinical uh, ideas about uh, cutoffs on, on, you know, the, the uh, usual uh, cognitive scale like MMSE scale. Uh, and as you probably know, that's a scale with 30 points and 20, a cutoff at 27 is an indication of cognitive impairment. A cutoff at, I think, around 24 uh, is an indication of dementia. And the general suggestion is that the cutoff for, for people living with late stage dementia might be 10. So as you understand, and it's generally extremely difficult to just uh, administer the, uh, the, um, the test. So, but that's sort of the general the clinical uh, uh, standard in, 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 man, in, in many um, settings. So it's, it's people with, who are severely challenged in most areas uh, of life, uh, people living with late stage dementia. So if you want to study late stage dementia, it's sort of, uh, it's also a challenge in terms of how to do research. Um, we've been very interested in, in a focus on what we call joint activities. That is, we, we have a focus on situations where people do things together. We are less interested in the abilities of isolated individuals. Uh, that's what you generally uh, get a, a sense of when you use different types of scales. But we're interested in, in how people living with late stage um, dementia can engage with other people because that sort of um, makes it possible to understand how people living with late stage dementia can use the, their remaining resources, whatever resources they have, then you have a possibility to study that. And also what kind of support they need in order to be able to participate in activities. So that's the reason why we focus on, on joint activities. And when you study people living with late stage dementia, there aren't that many um, possibilities. There are not that many kinds of activities that people are engaged in, which means that we've been studying eating situations, um, supported eating, We've been uh, um, uh, studying uh, getting up from a chair, sitting down on a chair, uh, finding your place around a table, uh, getting into bed, getting out of bed. And, and we have also looked at some uh, situations involving care, um, personal care, li like showering and, and, and uh, stuff like that. But mostly activities like sitting down or uh, uh, getting out of bed or something like that. So that's the kind of activity that actually fills the day for people living with late stage dementia. That's sort of their life world. It's dominate, dominate, um, it's, it's, uh, the, the, they, it's, it's a life world totally preoccupied by the sort of care for the body and, and what the body can do. Now, studying these kinds of activities is a bit more complicated compared to when you would study people living with early or mid-stage dementia. In, in, in people living with, with earlier, earlier phases of the dementia, you can generally use interviews, you can ask people things and you get fairly good answers uh, uh, um, as Steve Sabbath have shown in his research, uh, it's, it's, it's totally possible. It's almost impossible to do interviews with people living in, in, with late stage dementia because they don't use spoken language or, uh, at all. So it's, it's very difficult. 
uh, it's also difficult to record conversations, which you can do with people in, in earlier phases of, of dementia. You can record, uh, you know, um, reminiscence groups or, or uh, reading the, the paper or uh, taking part in quiz activities and things like that. That's quite common in the research about uh, 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 people living with dementia. None of these research methods are, are possible because they all rely on the use of spoken language and spoken language is quite secondary in, in interaction uh, um, with people living with late stage dementia. That means that you have to focus on nonverbal actions. That is what people do. Uh, how they use their body, how they position their bodies, gaze, gaze direction, touch, and so on and so forth. And in order to do that, you must use video, uh, uh, video recordings. Uh, and that's what we've been doing. We've been video recording all these everyday situations with assisted uh, eating or, or getting down, sitting down on a, a, a chair or, or whatever. And if you um, work with video, you're sort of facing a challenge uh, in, in analyzing uh, video material because you need um, to transcribe uh, nonverbal interaction. And in contrast to verbal interaction, there are no standardized uh, norms for transcriptions of nonverbal actions and interaction. Uh, and which is in a way quite from a methodological perspective is quite interesting because it forces you to think about how you can transcribe and how you can sort of analyze this kind of, of material. And you'll see later on some of, of the examples of the way we've used uh, or, or worked with transcriptions so far, although we've tried to develop uh, uh, our um, ideas about how to transcribe um, intercorporal interaction. So we've been using video uh, primarily as our, or, or uh, as our primary uh, data material. And we've videotaped people for hours doing all these everyday activities, uh, joint activities of, of uh, various kinds. Hmm. And why can't I? Oh, so then if you can't study spoken language, but you have to study nonverbal actions, then what, what counts as a, a nonverbal action? And that's what brought us into the discussion about intercorporal interaction, intercorporal collaboration and so on and so forth, which is, which is a fairly new field. Much of the research that has, uh, much of the research, first of all, by the way, is German. There's been several uh, uh, German research groups that sort of dealt with, with uh, uh, intercorporal uh, interaction. Um, but it's a fairly new area it's, uh, you, you, you know, that there, there have always been people who, who looked at the, the bodily interaction, even back in the 1950s, but as a, as a, a, a modern research area, it's sort of, you, the most of the research has, has been done in the last maybe 10 or 15 years, so it's quite recent field. Much of the research concerns sports activities um, of various kinds boxing, um, skiing, or, or, or whatever, football and, and stuff like that, or the crafts, um, you know, learning how to uh, work with textile or wood or something like that, There's, or, or mechanical uh, stuff. There's quite a lot of research. There's less research actually about intercorporeality in the care area. There are some research concerning um, care of, of small children uh, and, and some in the field of dementia. So, so the way we 
defined intercorporeal collaboration is that is it is how it is about how what we call concerted actions are produced that is how people use their bodies to do something together um, like going from standing position to sitting position, for instance, that's a good example, or getting food into the mouth, which I, I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a minute or so. So, <coughs> so for us, a bodily action is, is some kind of figure that stands out uh, as a figure against a background. A good example of that is in an eating situation with a moving hand going from the, the dish on the table moving up to the mouth. Everything is sort of static without the, the except for the hand who moves and the hands become a sort of a salient change in the situation um, and, and stands out as a figure. I'll, I'll, I'll give you more examples of that. So that's sort of what we think is a, 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 a bodily uh, action it's a figure against, against a background. And, and we think, at least from our perspective, bodily actions have, have at least four quite interesting qualities. First, they are quite what we call uh, autonomous. You, you can do and use bodily actions without using language, for instance. They're sort of uh, self-contained. You can, you can uh, so that's the first uh, uh, aspect. The second aspect is that they are intelligent and that in contrast to being a uh, reflex action or, or being sort of just random movements of the body. They're intelligent in the sense that they fit together with other actions that take place. And that leads to the third quality of bodily actions. They, they can anticipate actions. They are a sort of both responses to previous actions and they an anticipate the next actions. They are sort of part of a interactional sequence. And the fourth quality is that, which is in particular interesting for us as, as uh, researchers of dementia, and that is that bodily actions are not dependent on cognitive representations. You don't need to have a cognitive uh, schema or, or representation of what you're doing. It's sort of a very local interaction between bodies and between parts of bodies. So we have, in, in, in a sense that we have a, a, a very strong belief in, in, in what bodily actions actually can accomplish. So I'm gonna present uh, uh, one, of, one example from our research uh, and it concerns supported eating. And uh, most people, or, or I, I presume all people living with late stage dementia cannot eat on their own. Uh, they need support. Uh, they might need support with holding the, the spoon or, or something. And some people like the lady we are going to, to encounter in a couple of minutes, she can't even move her arms because she's totally immobile. She can't move any of her, her body parts at all. So she needs someone who sort of moves the spoon with food from the table to her mouth. And, and eating is, is kind of an interesting um, activity. Uh, if you look at eating from a Vygotskyan perspective, because learning to eat is something you do in an interpersonal matrix. You do it because your parent, your mother or father or someone helps you how to eat. You, you know, at first you get feeded, breastfed, and then you sort of 
then you in various ways learn how to use spoons and, and the dishes or whatever, you know, it's quite complicated if you start to think about it. But that's sort of a, a, a process that generally takes a couple of years before children are able to ma manipulate all the utens utensils they need for, for eating and, and doing it in a socially proper way. It, it generally takes about three years or something like that. And that's when the interpersonal eating turns into a uh, intrapersonal uh, activity to use Vygotsky's uh, uh, con concepts. It's something that the, the, the child can do on its own. And, and our idea is what happens when, in, in, at least in late stage dementia, is that it goes from an intrapersonal ability and back to being an interpersonal activity. It's something you need to do together with people. So you sort of, you, you come back to that situation. And that has a, a very important implication. It means that all the people that we study, both people living with dementia, but also staff and nurses are quite familiar uh, uh, with all these different aspects of eating and their bodies are very familiar uh, from early on in life uh, 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 with the eating uh, activity and the eating process, which I think we consider as, as quite important in understanding supporting, supported eating. Now, we have been <coughs> looking at episodes of uh, of um, supported eating. And we define the episode as it starts with the preparation for the eating. And in general, in, in nursing home, nursing homes, that means it starts when the staff either uh, helps someone <coughs> with a walker to enter into the dining area and sit down, or if it's a person in a wheelchair, wheels the chair into the, uh, into the dining area, to the table, sets the table and so on. And then when that sort of preparatory <coughs> stage, uh, the staging of the activity is sort of finished, then the proper eating uh, activity starts. And when we looked at, we had quite a few examples of supported eating, we've, we've um, uh, identified five, we call it local projects in, in the eating. I'll, I'll explain that. You could call it phases or, or, or stages or something, but it, it's five local projects that they need to go through for eating. So let's start by looking at the preparatory um, stage of the eating, the staging of the activity, sort of setting it up. And this is a, a quite interesting because in a way you could argue that um, staging the activity is just about getting things right, you know, getting a person into a chair, uh, getting the, the dish in front of the person and so on and so forth. And, 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 you know, it's, it's just a practical activity. But what we found is that it is at, at the same time as being a practical activity, it's also a communicative activity. And that's the, the reason we call it staging. It's, uh, it's uh, a way to indicate what is going on and what is going to be the next step in the activity by sort of organizing things in the environment, artifacts, by organizing the bodies of the two persons and by organizing the relationship between bodies, the, the two bodies and artifacts is a way also to communicate, that is to tell what kind of activity is going on and what's going uh, to come the next. It's a kind of indication. If you can't, if you can't use language and, and tell someone, well, now we, it's lunchtime, we're going to eat, and today we're going to eat, blah, blah, blah. If you can't do that, you need to use other semiotic means. And, and our idea is that you use indications. 
a kind of pointing, although they don't point, they position things in a certain position, which makes them meaningful in a certain way. And if we look at a, a, this is a, 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 from our videotape, we've just uh, as a per, you know as a side thing we we for ethical reasons we've uh, we don't use the actual video but, uh, but have sort of made them graphic by sort of outlining contours so so this is a typical situation where an old lady uh, sitting in a wheelchair she's been wheeled into the dining area and the the, the room and in almost all cases we've studied, the, the staff position themselves at, on the right side of the person in order, because that's most practical in order to both see the person and to help them. And they're generally sitting in a, a 90 degree uh, ang um, angle, uh, because that's a way of making it easier uh, with the gaze and eye contact. So this is the first part of the staging, putting the two persons and the artifacts, the, the dish and the spoon sort of uh, uh, in, uh, in an internal relation. And, <clears throat> and the next step is initiating the activity of eating. And this is generally also done partly verbally, but also very non-verbally. In, uh, in general, uh, the, the, the nurses say, okay, now we are going to eat. But whether the person with dementia understands that or not, we don't have a faintest. There's no signs that uh, in their gaze direction or anything else that sort of in, indicates that they actually uh, understand the verbal um, utterances from the the nurses, but what nurses do, they put a bib around the neck of the, of the of the person with dementia, and sort of at the same time as they say, "Now we're going to eat." You see the bib here. Uh, if you look closely at the old lady, you see she has a, a small bib around her neck, uh, um, sort of indicating. And and when the nurse has tied the bib around the neck, that, that's when the feeding, actual feeding, eating activity starts. Uh, and the, the last thing they do in staging the activity is establishing what we call a joint attentional space. That concept we, we borrowed from, from psychologists like Tomasello and other, uh, uh, Jerome Bruner and others. So the point is that in order, as you, you know, most nursing homes are quite busy. There's a lot of things going on there, other old people sitting around eating. So you need to establish a joint attention. You have to sort of be uh, uh, geared towards the same activity. And what we found out is this, that in as a, the very start of the eating activity, the nurse is looking for the gaze of the person with dementia. And the person with dementia is sort of responding and looking for the gaze of the nurse. And then the nurse looks at the dish where the spoon is. And the person with dementia sort of also looks at the spoon. So what you get is a small triangle. And that's where everything is going to happen. There's almost nothing going on outside this triangle that sort of has to do with the supported eating activity. So that's the sort of joint attentional space. That's where everything is going to happen. That's where gaze, hand movements are, are sort of identified. This then leads on to the actual uh, eating activity with five, what we call uh, local projects. And this is a sort of uh, an, an sequential of actions <coughs> that goes on and goes on. You can sort of repeat it immediately, or you can sort of have a pause between uh, and then resume and so on. Uh, 
And it starts with the nurse putting food on the spoon. If you look at figure five here, I could, I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, put it, uh, I, I couldn't isolate, isolate the figures in, in this uh, material. I'm sorry for that. But if you look at, at figure five, you have a nurse called Boonsri. She's putting, she's uh, moving around food, putting food on the, the spoon. And, and the uh, uh, old lady, she's called Soraya in this example. She's looking down at, at the, 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 uh, the spoon and the dish. And as next step, the, the nurse, uh, Boonstri, uh, she moves her hand from the dish, and this is figure six, from the dish to the mouth of the person. And it's very important. And, and while she's doing that, the nurse is monitoring the gaze of the old lady with dementia. And if the old lady with dementia doesn't look at the hand moving, then the nurse starts to move her hand, the spoon up and down in order to catch in, in uh, quotation marks, the attention of the lady with dementia. And when that happens, she can, and, and uh, she can continue to move her hand towards uh, uh, the mouth, the, and which you see in, in, in figure eight, when the lady opens her mouth and she can, the nurse can enter the food into the mouth and the old lady received the food which generally means that she um, closes the mouth and starts to chewing or process the food. And at that uh, point, the nurse retracts her hand and it goes back to the dish. So that's the full circle, the sequence. And, and then it could just be repeated once more, the same, exact the same uh, sequence. And what we found out is that there are some regulatory, what we call regulatory interactional mechanisms in, 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 uh, in this sequence that makes it something else than just a mechanical uh, system. Uh, and the first extremely important thing has to do with the mutual monitoring. That is that the, the nurse is looking at the uh, uh, old woman with dementia. She's not only looking at her, but she's looking at where the lady is looking. So it's a mutual, <coughs> it's part of a mutual monitoring and the old lady is looking at the nurse. Sometimes the gaze meet, but they also check that they both look at the same thing. So it's a mutual uh, gaze, both for joint attention, so they're looking at the moving hand or, or the spoon. But it's also important that, they, that the old lady have a, her gaze on the hand movement going up to the mouth. That's sort of quite important. The second regulatory interactional mechanism is the opening of the mouth. Because if, if I don't know if you, any of you had experience of working with people with dementia, you know, this is this one of the very important things that can happen in supported eating is that the person with dementia doesn't open her mouth. She keeps it closed. And that creates problems for the nurse. So opening and closing the mo mouth is very important for the progression of the sequences of, of supported eating. Uh, so two and three having to do with, with the mouth opening uh, and then closing the mouth and indicating some kind of processing. So all we, have, we found examples of, of uh, uh, situations where uh, the, the, the two persons lost their 
joint attention and, and they had to repair that. We had situations where the person with dementia didn't open the mouth or didn't close the mo mouth, which sort of in, it starts off quite a lot of activities on the nurse's uh, side of the activity of, of repairing uh, the sequence. So to conclude, uh, what we found is that uh, supported, supported eating is an, uh, an interactional process and it's uh, based on intercorporal collaboration. It, it's sort of, it's something you have to do together. You, you need to collaborate. And the second thing that we want to sort of uh, stress here is the uh, importance of what's generally in the literature called minor responses. It's extremely important when you work with people living with late stage dementia that you, you um, look for, look for and acknowledge all kinds of small uh, um, responses, small actions, uh, 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 a different uh, uh, direction of, of gaze, a mouth that doesn't open and so on and so forth. You, you won't find any big things. You'll find an, a number of extremely minor responses or contributions to the uh, to the activities and and from a clinical uh, aspect we think these two things are are uh, very important to teach in in uh, in um, for staff working with people with late stage dementia you have to see it's actually about collaboration it's not a mechanical uh, process in in quite a lot of the literature about eating supported what we call supported eating and dementia is called feeding and I think the, the, the uh, switch from supported eating to using the term feeding is in, indicative of, of also a different view of what the supported eating is about. Not collaboration, it's about feeding, getting food into a person. <clears throat> and if you work with, with uh, supporting eating, eating, you also know that feeding can be quite dangerous because food can be uh, um, get stuck in the throat of the person. So it's sort of, you have to be very, very careful uh, how you do this. Yeah.